chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, set the scene for these verses, the uh, nation of Israel and the nation of the Philistines were ready to do battle. One was lined up on one side of the mountain, and one was lined up on the other side of the valley, and uh, they were going to evidently fight in the valley. And while they were uh, getting ready to do battle, the Philistines had a giant by the name of Goliath on their side. And for 40 days, he would walk down into the valley, face the nation of Israel, and challenge them. And he said, uh, if you've got somebody to fight me, send him out. If he whips me, if he beats me, then uh, we'll be your slaves. You win the battle. But if I whip him, I kill him, then you will be our slaves. And he couldn't get anybody to challenge him. Forty days he did that. Finally, on the fortieth day, we find out little shepherd boy by the name of David had already been anointed as king and yet nobody knew anything about it except Samuel and he uh, said who is this fellow that defies the God of Israel and they told him who he was and he said well in essence why doesn't somebody go fight him and everybody seemed to was afraid to. But he accepted the challenge and he went out to do battle. Verse 31 of 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a lot here so I'll probably finish it up tonight. But when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And you could imagine what Saul felt about that. He was the king, and he was used to doing battle. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him. Thou art but a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and went after him, and smote him, delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be one of them, seeing he hath defied the army of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And then Saul armed David with his armor. He tried to dress him up like he would be dressed to go to battle. He put a helmet of brass upon his head he armed him with a coat of mail. Dale, David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed to go, or decided not to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hands and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a strip, and his sling was in his hand. He drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bared the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and moody and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with stains? And the Philistine 
cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Cut to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will take thine head from thee. From thee I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. That's a message within itself. The uh, battle is the Lord's. What we're going through today with this virus and everything that's taking place in America, uh, let's not forget that God is still in charge. And he can fix anything that needs to be fixed. He can change anybody that needs to be changed. And we just keep trusting him. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to David. David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out, took thence a stone and slain it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. And so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof, slew him, cut his head off therewith. And when the Philistine saw their champion was dead, they fled, fled. Uh, our message this morning, our thought is facing the giants. Help us, Father, as we study your word together and apply it to our hearts and lives. Meet every need, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This giant that David faced was nine and a half feet tall. His armor weighed 220 pounds. His spear alone weighed 26 pounds. And of course, he had an armor bearer that went before him to protect him. David didn't have anything but a sling. Now, some of you fellows, when you were younger, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, used to, in tires, they had what we call inner tubes. And we would find an old inner tube that someone had done away with. And we would cut strips out of that inner tube and we'd make a slingshot. And uh, how many of you have ever done that? Joe, you surely did that, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. And we got pretty good at that. Almost broke some windows a time or two. <laughs> Almost got into trouble, but it was fun. Playing with a slingshot. David wasn't plucking. And uh, he used this as a weapon. And there were other uh, soldiers that later on would use this as a weapon. And somebody said, um, why did David get five stones instead of just one? Because Goliath had four brothers. And David didn't know who they were. But he was ready for them. And later on in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 22, the Bible teaches us that David and his soldiers killed the other four. He eventually got all of them. All the brothers of life. And I thought this morning is, and probably tear you into tonight, everybody faces giants. I may not be nine and a half feet tall and uh, have armor and all that kind of stuff, but everybody, in the sound of my voice, faces giants daily. What's the name of the giant that you might be facing today? It might be a physical giant. 
how many people do I know that are struggling with cancer or heart attack or some kind of physical problem? And when these things happen to us and they're severe enough, it's almost like they're bigger than God himself as we struggle to face that giant. Then some are going through a financial giant, facing a financial giant. And uh, when we, uh, of course, don't have enough money coming in to cover our needs, then what a giant that can be. All of us at some point in our lives probably have faced this giant. And then there's the spiritual giant. There may be somebody listening to the sound of my voice right now that's struggling somehow in a spiritual manner. You have a physical, a spiritual need this morning and nobody can meet it but God. We're all tested. We're all tested. All of us are. Everybody faces giants. You know what? There's no new giants. There has no temptation, no test taken you, but such as is common to man. Oh, we go through these situations and we face these giants and, and we have this physical giant we're facing and we say nobody's ever felt like this before. Yes, they have. We may be facing that financial giant. We think to ourselves, nobody's ever gone through this before. And yes, they have. We may be facing a spiritual giant today. We have a spiritual need. And Satan comes along and makes us feel guilty. And maybe our thoughts that we're thinking or something we've said or done. And he has a field day with it. But God's bigger than any of these giants. And so there's none new. Every, every giant that you and I have faced and ever will face have been faced by somebody else. Certain, uh, certainly we know when Jesus was here on earth and walked for 33 and a half years, According to the word of God, he was tested, tempted in all points like we are, yeah, without sin. What does that mean? That means that he faced every time that I will ever have to face. As I go through life and I face these giants, physical, spiritual, financial giants, I might think to myself, my land, nobody's ever been here before, but Jesus has been. He's been tested in all points like we are, and yet he overcame them all. And so he's the one that can help us to overcome our giants. Now, certain circumstances about our situations may be new and unique, unique, uh, unique to us, but all, all giants are old, and they're just new to us. Zella told me, he said, uh, I thought I was the only one with this problem. I said, no, sir, you're not the only one. I won't do this, but I can list a lot of folks that have the same problem you have and are facing the same giant that you're facing today. No, you're not alone. One thing, God's there, he'll help you. And we'll do what we can to help you. But I can name a whole bunch of other folks that are struggling with the same giant. Everybody facing giants. All of us do. And uh, all Israel was fear, fearful of this giant. In verse 11 it says, King Saul and all Israel were dismayed and greatly feared. Every one of them, the whole nation of Israel, every soldier in the army of Israel was dismayed and scared to death, afraid to face this giant. And we look at David, and David said, man, a bear came and going to kill my sheep, and I, I can't 
children. And a, bear, a, a lion came and was going to kill my sheep. And I, I screamed. David said, this fellow that's cursing the God of Israel, he's no different than a bear or a lion. I'll, I'll tackle him. But did you know that David had this brain front? But David was a man just like me and just like you. David had the same feelings and emotions that we had. And according to Psalm 56, verse 3, David said, What time I am afraid, I'll trust you, Lord. What time I am afraid. Don't you think maybe David had some fear in his heart, but he picked his stones up and went to do the job anyway. And that's the way it is with us. Even though these giants are big and powerful and cause a lot of distress and makes us fearful even in, at times, we just pick up the sling and the stones and face them anyway. One of the biggest fears that we face is life itself. We fear life. The fear of getting what we want. Uh, or I, am I really going to be able to get the things that I would want to have? And then there's the fear of losing that which we have. How am I going to maintain this which I have? How am I going to keep it? And so that's life itself. That's the two fears of life. How am I going to keep what I have? What am I, how am I going to get what I want? And so uh, it causes something, a giant called worry. The best definition that I have ever heard was given by Winston Churchill, who was a statesman, great statesman of great, great during World War II. He said, worry is an emotional spasm. Did you get that? An emotional spasm. Am I going to get what I want? Am I going to keep what I have? That's worry. It's an emotional spasm. Which occurs when the mind catches hold of something and will not let it go. An emotional spasm. The mind catches hold of something, a thought that makes us work, and it won't turn it loose. Get up in the morning and there it is. All day long, there it is. Get ready to go to bed, there it is. Trying to go to sleep and rest, there it is. An emotional spasm. I, I, we as Christians, if we're not careful, We'll get offended about the least little things and cause us to worry and to pray. And it grabs hold of the mind that thought does. And it won't turn it loose. I've seen people pray and worry about something for days and weeks and months and even years. And then Charles Mayo, a physician or doctor who founded Mayo Clinic, which you won't hear one of the most famous, best hospitals in the world, called worry the disease of doubt that can affect the circulation, the heart, the glands, and the whole nervous system. That's what worry does. It affects the circulation, the heart, the gland, the whole nervous system. Worry will kill us. And that's why it's so important that we face this giant every day and realize that 95% of those thoughts that cross our mind that worry us never happen. And the other 5% is not as bad as we thought it was going to be. So folks, face this giant. Life itself, you have to face it every day. Learn to face it. Learn to depend on the Lord. And learn to allow the Lord to help you and take care of those thoughts that grab your mind and won't turn around. Put 
those things in God's hand. And then there's the fear of death. When we get older, <coughs> this giant gets bigger than the life itself. Uh, the older I get, the more I think about death and dying. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. I'm going to die if Jesus doesn't come. That's just a reality. I have to face this giant. I better get myself ready to die. I've, been, I've got an appointment to keep. There's no way I can get out of it. It's as sure as life itself. I better get ready for this appointment. We have the five beads to look forward to. Uh, bursitis, bulges, bridges, baldness, and biceps. What happened to my biceps? I got more under my arm than I have on the top. Don't you guys look at me. You've got the same problem. <laughs> we need to put this giant today. <coughs> Second Corinthians 6 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I have watched uh, a lot of my buddy preachers die. I mean, I've lost a slew of them that have passed on. <coughs> I remember my pastor himself, Roy Julian, I watched him suffer through cancer and finally leave this world. I was with him not a short time before he passed away. And all this is said, we shall him. know that the Lord's uh, how He was in terrible shape. But he faced that giant well. Two weeks before he died, he, he sat in a chair and preached his last sermon. His deacons had to carry him out of that chair and move him up in the bus and carry him home. And he faced that time pretty well, I would say. And so we have to get ready and prepare to meet this giant. We can't put it off. The best thing to do is trust Jesus as your personal Savior and uh, just trust him with your soul, with your life. And when it comes time to die, we'll just pass through the valley of the shadow of death and he'll be with us. And then last of all there's a fear of eternity. What is that the man wants to die? And after this, the judgment. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. And then shall every one of us give an accounting of himself to God. I sometimes let my mind wander out there into eternity and wonder what it's going to be like when we leave this world and we're face to face with God himself. Every knee shall die. And that's why it's so good for us as a believer to bow on this side of eternity so we don't have to worry about bowing on the other side. If we'll bow our knee to God on this side of eternity, it'll be a lot easier <coughs> to bow the knee on the other side of eternity. I can't hardly imagine all these people in the world today that would sell their soul for the power to be a leader in a nation or a leader in the world and yet one day stand before God never bowed their knee to him in this, on this side of the earth eternity and how they're going to feel when their knees just buckle and they fall down before God and say God why God but it'll be too late then we must bow to Jesus and confess him on this side of eternity <coughs> after death It'll be too late. Did you know, folks, think about this for a minute. We are living in eternity right now. We're not going to die and all of a sudden have eternity. So, we're, we have eternal life now. Everybody that's born into this world has eternal life. There 
going to live somewhere forever. This earth, this world is just the beginning of eternity. This is the dressing room for eternity. God puts us here on earth and gives us the chance, the opportunity to prepare to live in eternity after we die. I'm living in eternity now. I have eternal life. Even a person who refuses to bow to God, they have eternal life also. And when they die, they're just going to change location. They'll live somewhere forever. This world is just the beginning. Oh, how I wish I could get everyone to see that they have eternal life. They're living in eternity right now. And death just puts them in the latter part of eternity. Jesus has already told us, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yes, shall we live? If we will put our faith and trust in Christ, we'll spend our eternity with Him in heaven. If we reject Him and refuse to bow our knee to Him in this world at the beginning of eternity, then we'll spend eternity with Satan, the devil, and the fifth of hell forever. Now, I don't like to think about that. I don't even like to say it. But it's a reality. The sooner you defeat this giant, the better off you will be. Get ready for death, beat it. Get ready for eternity with the giant. David killed this giant. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I rod my staff that comfort me. David, on this side of eternity, prepared his heart to meet his God. And he said, he'll meet me. He'll walk with me. He's got a rod and a staff to protect me. He'll make sure that I end up in heaven, paradise, with him. Job, about this settled. He said, one <coughs> heaven man die, Shall he see God? And then in Job chapter 20, verse 25 and 26, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And I, though after my skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job said, all of this sickness, this infirmity, worms are eating up my body. But I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that I'll see one of these days out there in eternity in my own body. Job done it settled before he died. The giant of death and the giant of eternity. David and Job and many of the men and women in the scripture got these giants defeated. They defeated the giant of life, the giant of death, and the giant of eternity. And they're out there in eternity somewhere this morning rejoicing over what Jesus Christ did for them. They've already bowed their knee to him, and they'll be with him on that side of eternity forever. What a blessing to know that. You bow your heads with us and let's ask the Lord to help us this morning.